Hello, my name is Michelle Morand. I am a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate, and I'm here today with precision cancer medicine research specialist, Alexander Rowland. He's prepared a presentation for you today um, for um, really a population of patients who have not had the best options, sadly, that those with uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and there's an exciting new development about a new combination of therapies that's really adding many years of lives to many of these patients. So I want to let Alex take it from here. Alex, tell us all about it. Yeah, so this is a um, combination of drugs that and, and therapies that are commonly used, but um, they're not typically used in this, com this combination and, and this particular setting. Uh, so once, you know, once again, what's really important about precision oncology to understand is it is the right drug at the right time for the right patient. And so this really speaks to the right time and how timing is important when it comes to certain drug combinations. Okay. So uh, colorectal cancers, um, very common. Um, they have various biomarkers that can change how they respond to standard chemotherapy and standard treatment, for example, such uh, certain certain uh, biomarkers such as mutations in the RAS genes, NRAS, KRAS, and so on, uh, PIK3CA signaling, uh, AKT signaling, uh, BRAF mutations, all of these can reduce how, you know, reduce the benefits of standard, uh, standard protocols in colorectal cancers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some of them do have some targeted therapies like BRAF, uh, but others don't. And what's important is that when you have these sort of alterations, uh, it really can uh, sideline things and, and have patients not respond as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, with the RAS, it's a classic example. Uh, it's a very common mutation. We see it in a lot of, of colorectal cancers, um, but it can make a big difference in overall survival with standard care. So uh, basically immune therapy, um, and focusing on program DEATH-1 inhibitors, PD-1 inhibitors, um, has changed the landscape for many different cancers. And one of the biggest challenges is finding out which patients will benefit from it and which patients won't. We have a list of molecular features and molecular markers that we use to try to determine whether a patient's gonna have a good response or no response at all. And there's also a, a variety of different drugs that can be used as immune therapy enhancers that can allow PD-1 inhibitors to work better than they normally would um, with uh, synergistic combinations. However, as a single agent, immune therapy has shown um, only to benefit patients that have very key specific molecular features. Um, and those, those molecular features are microsatellite instability and mismatch repair deficiency. But for the most part, um, if someone doesn't have that, then they won't get a response from PD-1 inhibitors, single agents. Mm. And that's why immune therapy is often restricted for colorectal cancers. Mm. However, that is changing. So the current standard care uh, is for colorectal cancers um, or advanced colorectal cancers is a combination of treatment protocols called Fulfox and Fulfiri. Um, that can also be substituted with Capox and Capiri. Um, where capocytabine, which is an oral version of 5 uh, fluorouracil, um, is used. Typically, if you have a RAS mutation, it gets you about 27 months if you're stage 4. Uh, without a RAS mutation, uh, it can be 37, you know, sometimes up to 40 months of um, average overall survival. But, you know, once again, this is not the greatest survival time for some pretty heavy-duty chemotherapy combinations. Mm. Now, um, I did write in there, Tribe 1. Um, tribe 1 was a protocol where they combined Fulfox and Fulfury to and added Avastin, and they call that Fulfoxiri. Um, it's actually a new combination. It's new standard of care. Uh, it hasn't quite reached Canada yet, but it is pretty common in other countries. What about immune therapy? Well, previous data from a variety of studies, uh, one of them is called the Avana, the other one's called the Avarectal. And then the Atezo tribe, where they actually use the tribe protocol in combination with immune therapy, have shown that, that when a PD-1 in immune checkpoint inhibitor is added to specifically neoadjuvant chemo and radiation, 
it increases the chance of the patient getting what's called a pathological complete response. This is referred to as a path CR or a PCR. Now, a path CR basically means uh, you get the surgery or you, so you get the treatment. And then when you go for surgery, uh, there's no more tumors left to excise. So it's considered a holy grail of responses. It's rare to get a path CR from standard chemo. Uh, it's about 13 to 15% from historical data in stage three and four metastatic colorectal cancer patients. But when you add immune therapy to neoadjuvant chemo radiation, it can increase the chance of getting a pathological complete response to as high as 37.5% in one of the studies. So why is that important? Um, and what is neoadjuvant? Well, we're going to cover that. So neoadjuvant basically means prior to surgery, um, it's the first treatment you get, um, and adjuvant is post-surgery. So why is a path CR um, after neoadjuvant therapy essential in the neoadjuvant setting? Specifically with colorectal cancers, if you get a path CR with your neoadjuvant treatment, then you have a really good chance, like up in the high 90s, uh, or, you know, 90 and above, of being cancer-free for at least 10 years. Um, and many patients just never have a recurrence. So, so once again, a path CR for colorectal cancer in the neoadjuvant setting is really, really a good thing. Uh, it's just hard to get. And it only happens, as I mentioned, between 15% you know, of cases with standard chemo. But 37.5 with immune therapy. Exactly. Yes. What's important to understand is that we're talking about microsatellite proficient and mismatch repair proficient cases. So these patients normally would not get any benefit from immune therapy. Um, they don't have dysfunctional mismatch repair or microsatellite instability. If they did, then single agent immune therapy could be very, very effective for them. But these are patients that don't have that molecular feature. And so they wouldn't normally be given an immune therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so we've covered those three previous studies. Now, a recent study called the TORCH study uh, found that integration of a PD-1 inhibitor, uh, toripalumab, that's a new PD-1 inhibitor, um, combined with total neoadjuvant therapy was associated with good outcomes in patients with proficient uh, mismatch repair and microsatellite uh, stability. And this is in locally advanced rectal cancer. So in this study, patients with locally advanced T3 to 4 and N plus rectal adenocarcinoma were randomly assigned to either um, A protocol, which is uh, radiotherapy, um, immune therapy, and then uh, chemotherapy, um, or uh, chemotherapy followed by a short course of radiotherapy and immunotherapy. So in both cases, um, it was a short course of uh, somewhat, somewhat short course of therapy, um, as usually is in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, slightly different protocols. But in both cases, it was a combination of radiation, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy. And that's really the take-home message here. Um, and it once again, it's in the neoadjuvant setting. So in this particular uh, study, the patients underwent a total uh, mesorectal excision, or they went on to a watch and wait based on tumor response. So the primary endpoint in this trial, in other words, you know, the the main focus of this trial was a complete response, uh, including a pathological complete response after surgery and a clinical complete responses in cases of watch and wait. So treatments were deemed successful if a threshold a complete response of 40% is reached. So once again, the standard uh, without immune therapy with chemo and radiation in the neoadjuvant setting for this group of patients, um, historically, from what I've seen, is about 15%. Now, in this trial, they are referring to a 25% historical data um, from, from total neoadjuvant treatment. So mm -hmm. anything above, you know, a 25% is a good thing based uh, for this trial. So the results, um, the complete response for group A is 56.5%. And then among 35 patients in the complete response group, uh, 20 had a path CR. And 15 who underwent wait and watch had a continuous clinical complete response. So substantial changes and differences by adding this immune therapy drug in this setting. Uh, group B, 
uh, 54.2% had a complete response. Um, out of the 32 patients with a complete response, 17 had a pathological complete response, and 15 who underwent watch and wait had a continuous clinical complete response. So these are really exceptional responses here. And these patients are going to have a very good long-term survival compared to patients that did not get neoadjuvant immune therapy. Wow. Uh, adverse events, um, group A, the AEs, uh, grade three and four AEs were 45.2%, um, uh, mostly thrombocytopenia and neutropenia, which is pretty common with the chemotherapy. Uh, both of these are common side effects of the chemotherapy uh, is 42.4% in uh, group B. So one of the limitations of this study um, is it didn't have an actual control group. And we know that when um, you have a control group in a clinical trial, patients usually do better in a clinical trial as a control group than they do um, just going to a hospital getting the same treatment. And that's because they get better care. You know, they get better one-on-one -on -one treatment. Um, there's a lot more attention to them because they're in the trial. However, um, using the historical past CR rate of 25% um, as a cutoff, in my personal opinion, is a generous it's quite generous because uh, typically we don't see that sort of rates of no. CRs in patients that uh, just get standard care. Yeah. Well, as you said earlier, the statistics are more 13 to 15 percent. So I would be curious to know where they got that from. But the, the, the point probably is updated, probably updated results and so on. And, you know, they probably used a few different studies and they probably focus mostly on rectal uh, versus colorectal, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, some variation on the site of the primary. Um, rectal cancers do respond better to immune therapy than um, colorectal cancers, such as, uh, you know, ones that have, uh, uh, you know, in the distal or the proximal. Um, for some reason, uh, it seems that um, rectal cancers are a little more uh, involved in the immune system than mm. other colorectals. Mm. So location is important here. Mm. Um, but Really, I feel strongly now. I mean, there's been these studies, um, the previous studies, we did videos on those, and now we have this tying it all together. I feel really strongly that chemo, uh, radiation, and immune therapy should be the new standard of care for locally advanced metastatic colorectal cancers. I think it's going to make a huge difference in uh, the rectal and colorectal cancer uh, area. The data seems to suggest that, that it getting... getting you know, it really does. And it's a hard sell. It's hard to get oncologists to prescribe uh, neoadjuvant immune therapy. In the cases that we've been able to do that, those patients have all had a path CR. True. Oh, I've seen, I've seen yeah. it. Wow. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that just for a minute. Mm -hmm. if, if standard of care determines whether or not you are given immune therapy based on your MSI and MMR status, right? It's just, Typically, that's what you said, or no? So if you have disease mismatch repair, uh, or sorry, deficient mismatch repair and deficient microsatellite instability, then immune therapy is standard of care. Okay. So if the, if if usually, I'm speaking to you folks at home who have a loved one or who are dealing with this illness yourself, because um, this information is really exciting. It's a game changer. And yes, we have had patients for quite a few years now that Alex helped get on this combination who, when they went for surgery, didn't need to have the surgery because there was no evidence of disease. So we know this, this we know firsthand this protocol has benefit. But yeah. if you're thinking, okay, how do I how do I get my oncologist on board with this? Um, that's why I'm asking these questions of Alex. We can talk this through for you. So if if your oncologist is kind of coming from the perspective that, well, normally immune therapy isn't used unless you're deficient in MSI and MMR, and this information, MSI, MMR status, that is is part of standard pathology, Alex, or do, yeah. do you have to do it? Yeah, it do. is. No, they do do that in standard pathology. Um, yeah. Um, okay. But it's also part of standard uh, next generation sequencing too. Yeah. So if you had tumor DNA sequencing beyond what your standard of care cancer agency provided for you, this would naturally be info you'd have. But yeah, most hospital pathology labs are at least assessing for this uh, MSI and MMR status with yeah. your um, bio biopsy sample as part of your initial diagnosis. Where I'm going with this, folks, is if your oncologist believes still 
that if you are not deficient in MSI or MMR, immune therapy will not be beneficial for you. You're going to have to gather a bit of data for your doctor. Alex and his team are here to help put together uh, what we call a white paper. Uh, it's a short document that basically lays out the new science and helps advocate for your doctor to get on board with this combination. So if you're going to go straight to your doctor and you're going to ask for this new combination, don't be surprised if they say no. But understand that no from your doctor when you're asking without the data on hand is not the same thing as the answer you'll get when you get the data to provide them. They just perhaps aren't aware that immune therapy can be beneficial even if you're not deficient in the MSI and MMR. So I just want to I want to arm you so that you're not dismayed and you're not dissuaded from going for this combination. If this is you and you'd like to have this happen, you're newly diagnosed, nothing's happened yet, uh, or you know someone who's newly diagnosed with colorectal cancer, you want to make sure they get started on the right therapy. It's clearly this combination. Mm. That's what the data is showing. Yeah. And even if your doctor says, no, you, you're, you're not, you don't qualify for immune therapy, understand the only reason that that would really be legitimate perhaps is if you're missing a kidney like some of the some of the primary comorbidities that might make a doctor reluctant to prescribe immune therapy for you but it isn't got anything to do with the msi and the mmr which they might still be thinking so yeah that and if if you want help advocating that's what we're here for that is exactly our mission is to make sure that you don't have to do the heavy lifting of advocating with your doctor you have a team to do that for you um, but if you're going to go for it yourself just take the data take the information about immune therapy working even if you're not deficient with mm msi and mmr be prepared to answer that question and really advocate for this because obviously the data is there that this is the better approach pre-surgery yeah and and i think really where the confusion lies is that um uh i think a lot of doctors don't understand that the setting is really important in that sense of immune therapy um neoadjuvant yeah. immune therapy is really important in the neoadjuvant setting um because the, the primary tumor which is the one that first grows has a bunch of antigens and um different you know molecular features on it that when you take a PD-1 inhibitor, it boosts the immune system to take a repertoire of what the cancer looks like and to create antibodies against it. Mm -hmm. um, once a cancer metastasizes, um, they often lose a lot of those uh, antigens. And so they're harder to recognize and create antibodies against. Mm -hmm. So having that original primary tumor exposed to an immune system that is primed by a PD-1 inhibitor can really go a long way in preventing recurrence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the data is there, folks. Don't yeah. be snowed. Don't settle for standard full fox, full fox eerie, et cetera, et cetera. Get this combination. It's a thing. The data is there. And these drugs are accessible. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like these are even new drugs. Yeah. Well, the drug used in this study was uh, a new drug, but, um, you know, we see that uh, the responses are consistent against PD-1 inhibitors. I mean, most yeah. PD-1 inhibitors work in a similar fashion. Yeah. Some of the newer PD-1 inhibitors um, can be a little more advanced. Um, we won't get into why, but, um, you know, we're going to see, a, we, we are going to see an evolution of PD-1 inhibitors. Which is of even course. more exciting because the folks that yes. we've seen have this pathological complete response when we've put this combination together for them, um, they were using the old, older immune. They were, they were using the very first ones. Yeah. Yeah. So it's only Bolamab and uh, Keytruda. Yeah. Anyway, you don't have to go it alone, folks. We're here to help you by all means. If you want to, if you want to do it yourself, do it. We have a, a, self-advocacy training program here. You'll see the link here. You can join. There's lots of information uh, and regular Zooms to help guide you. Um, but really, if you want a team of experts who know how to figure out what you need and know how to arrange it with your doctor, uh, that's Alex and his team. So book in a consultation with them. And of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel and stay informed. Thanks, Alex. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.